So now we're going to talk about chapter one. And so you've already watched the lectures on chapter one. You've, you've learned about the material about chapter one. So the first week of class, or sorry, the second week of class, um, which was the week that we actually talked about, you know, economics, we, we talked about chapter one. And so what we discussed was we looked at it and we said, okay, let's figure out the differences in economics. Let's figure out what we're really interested in when it comes to economics. So one of the areas that the textbook talks about is positive economic, positive questions versus normative questions. And in economics, we focus on positive questions. We focus on questions that are, if you do this, then what happens? If this, then what? That's what we're concerned with with economics. And with normative questions, those are questions that are for philosophy. Those are questions for political science. Those are questions for sociology. And those questions are, if you do this, then this occurs and that's bad or that's good. We don't put in what I call that moral or ethical judgment in economics. We don't, that, those are normative questions and that's not something we look into. That's not something we're interested in. All we're interested in are the positive questions. If we can do this, then what happens? And because of that, you, you get answers. Now, one thing that I want to be very clear on, just because you have an economic answer, economics tells us this, that doesn't mean that that is the way you should follow, that's the way you should do. You, you may need to put in, and I would highly recommend putting in, your own moral or ethical judgments in there. But economics is just a tool, a decision-making tool that is used by individuals to answer certain questions. You can look at economic questions and get answers that violate your moral ethical beliefs. That doesn't mean you should follow what economics says. It just says this is how economics looks at this. You know, in class, in the in-class lectures, one of the examples that I talked about was, you know, what's the most you should pay your employee? What answer, what gets you the most benefit as you as a business owner? What's to pay your employee as little as possible? Um, you know, the, the, the least you can pay someone is zero. Slavery was, you know, we'll talk about efficiency and equity here in a second and how economics, we care about efficiency, what's most efficient. We don't care about what's most equitable. So efficiency and positive questions go together, just like equitable and normative questions go together. We don't look at the equitable answer. We're not looking for the normative answer. We're looking for what's most efficient. What answers the question, if this, then that? For efficiency, what gives us the output for the least amount of input? That gives us most efficient. And that's what economics will help us with. Like I said, that doesn't mean that's the answer we always go with. That's just an answer. Slavery was very efficient. It was also morally and ethically horribly, horribly wrong, horribly bad. But that's still not the, the economics is, yes, it's efficient. But your morals and ethics have to kick in to go, yeah, it's efficient, but we're not doing that. So that's what I want you to look at. And economics is keep in mind, yeah, there are moral and ethical answers out there that are different than the economic answers. In economics, we look at answering normative, sorry, positive questions, and we look at what is most efficient, not the other. 
So one of the areas that we talked about in class, one of the examples I used was, think about you have a hotel. And at that hotel, there are people lined up to get into your hotel. There's a horrible hurricane coming. Your hotel is the only place they can stay. There are 20 people in line. You have five rooms. How do you, how do you decide who gets the five rooms? Because if the people don't get the rooms, we're going to assume in my scenario they die. So we're going to go worst case scenario. How, you, how do you decide who gets the rooms? Do you go by who can pay the most? That's, you know, in economics, something we look at as that's probably the efficient answer. The efficient answer is who pays the, who can pay the most? That's the easiest way to determine that and to determine that. Um, you know, some arguments are, okay, well, that's not fair. That harms those in poverty and it benefits those in the wealth. Okay. What's your other answer? Maybe you want to go with, well, the first one's there. They're, they're the ones who deserve it. Could be. Could be that the first one's there. Let's say the first person there ran the seventh person there off the road to get there. Or the seventh person there had to stop and help an injured family or to pick up a loved one or to help out some orphan children. And that they really have a much greater need than that first person. As you can see, it's difficult to make the determination as to what is fair, what is not fair. That's why in economics, we take out that fairness and we look at efficiency. The most efficient option is to see who pays the most. They're the ones who quote unquote, want it the most. Therefore they get it and they're willing to sacrifice their money for that or there's something of value for that. And that's what we look at. Um, unfortunately, the hotel owner is not allowed to do that. Um, there are laws in place that keep that from happening. And so you will see this a couple of times. The textbook talks about that somehow that's, that's illegal to charge higher prices during times of emergency. That actually goes against economic theory and it may cause greater harm. And so the example I talked about in class is, let's say I get my first person, we decide to go first in line, gets it. They paid the hundred bucks for the room. They can turn around and then rent out part of that room to two or three other people who were not gonna get a room, charge them 300 bucks each, end up making $1,100 off the room, all because the price gouging laws affect the owner, not the person who subsequently rents it and so the owner who took all the risk who spent the money to get the hotel up and going they're not able to benefit from this but someone else is so there are issues with all of these economics tries to cut away and say we're not looking at what's fair we're looking at what is most efficient and that's what our concern is in economics Chapter one also does a little bit of talk about the difference between micro and macro. Macroeconomics is the study of um, global economics or national economics or regional economics. We talk about GDP, GNP, which is gross domestic product, gross national product, unemployment rates, uh, national interest rates. We look at things like that and that's macroeconomics. This is microeconomics. Microeconomics is basically decision-making and it's decision-making on an individual level as well as decision-making on a business level or an industry level. I like microeconomics a lot better. I think microeconomics is the most important course you take because everything comes back to decision-making. I like to pick on macroeconomists and tell them that they are fake economists because the stuff they come up with um, it can't be proven. I like to talk about how they can't prove any of their stuff. They tell me that if interest rates rise, that's gonna harm unemployment. My answer is prove it. And the issue with proving it is there's so much goes on in a global economy or a national economy, you can't just isolate that one thing. Okay, interest rates go up. Well, there's probably eight or nine other things that's happening as well. 
and all those things interact to cause a change in unemployment. So that's why I like to pick on them and tell, and tell them they can't really um, prove anything that they do and they like to argue with me, but this is my class so I get to pick on them. Um, it then talks, we then talk about the six primary factors of economics, of microeconomics. We talk about a couple of them now, the rest are in later chapters, but we talk about um, one of the, the primary components of economics is the concept of scarcity. So scarcity is when we have unlimited needs and wants, but limited resources. We can't have everything we want. So those things are limited. So economics comes in and decides, okay, who gets what? How much of this do we get? Who gets this? Who gets that? And, and that's what economics looks at. And so a lot of it comes down to what we use as the pricing mechanism. Um, everybody would love to have bags of diamonds. However, the pricing mechanism keeps that from happening and that higher pricing keeps people from buying them. So we'll talk about how scarcity is used in economics, especially how it's used with the pricing mechanism. Another concept we'll talk quite a bit about is incentives. Um, incentives matter a lot in economics. Incentives are very important in economics. Incentives are important in life. You've been incentivized ever since you were a child. Don't eat your, don't eat your dessert until you eat all your dinner, until you eat your vegetables. That's an incentive. Um, don't act up or you get a timeout. If you don't start being good, you're going to get punished. If you don't do this, you're going to get a spanking. Those are incentives. In class, every day, I have every student in there wearing a mask. I don't have a mask with me. Mine's out by the door as you go to leave my house, but everybody wears a mask. Why? There's, there's no um, person. I don't stand there with a gun pointed at you, yelling at you to put on your mask or else. The reason why is you've been incentivized. You know that if you don't wear a mask, you're not allowed to come in class. That's an incentive. Um, the same reason why when you drive, you, you don't drive 100, 120 miles an hour. You're incentivized. You don't want to get that ticket. You don't want to go to jail for reckless driving. Those are all incentives. We're constantly being incentivized. Um, as I talked in class, last year, I did a horrible job of incentives. I failed at incentives. I am the director of the Scarlet to Black Financial Literacy Program. We wanted to encourage students to attend our workshops and do some of the other stuff we did. So we came up with a point system and whoever had the most points at the end was gonna receive a $1,000 um, gift, scholarship, funds, whatever. And out of the 1,200 students who were first year students who were eligible, we had a total of two. attend every workshop. Workshops were, there were nine workshops, each one was about an hour long. So you're looking at basically making about 110 bucks an hour. Um, and so after thinking about it, I realized that I failed with incentives. My problem was is the incentive that I chose was a long-term incentive. You weren't gonna get it till the end of the year. We as humans are really bad with long-term incentives. For an incentive to work, it has to be something we care about. And I'm betting most people care about money, but it also has to be a time frame we care about. And a year for a first year college student, it's a long time. Um, whereas what I should have done would have been a better incentive was to, for every workshop, give away $100. You attend a workshop, we'll randomly draw out a name, you get 100 bucks. And I'm betting that we would have had a lot more attendance for people to win the chance to get $100. Um, so that's a case where I failed as incentives. Uh, incentives, incentives fail. Um, sometimes what we think is incentivizing actually does poorly. We have tried to provide incentives for people to drive safer. So one of the, some of the things we've done is we've required seatbelts. 
we now have front airbags, rear airbags, side airbags, top airbags, airbags everywhere. And what we see with that is, is that's actually um, the incentive we've done is we've incentivized people to drive a little more recklessly because now that risk of, you know, having a car wreck and harming yourself has gone, has gone away because of all the safety features. If you want to, you know, improve vehicle safety, there's an easy way to do it. Take a very large, sharp knife, the sharpest knife you can find, and attach it to the steering wheel to where the blade of the knife is about three inches from the driver's chest. So if they get hit or they slam on the brakes or anything like that, knife goes through them. You'll be amazed at how safe people start driving when that happens. That's an incentive. Now, probably would cause some issues. Not sure of the legality of that, but if we want to incentivize safe driving, that's a great way to incentivize safe driving. The last thing that we talked about this week in class was about the market. And we talked about two different types of markets. We talked about the cash market versus the barter market. The barter market, cash market is by far much more common. Um, and it's basically, I give you cash, you give me an item or service, and then you take that cash and you buy something and give that cash and get the item or service. We, we like the cash market because it's easy to figure out the transaction costs. It's easy to figure out. I'm not having to figure out, okay, you know, I really want that car, how many chickens do I own? That'll be the same as that car. A lot easier dealing with cash. But there's a barter market. Barter markets exist um, in certain areas and they're, they're common in certain areas. Uh, the example that I talked about in class, at one time, Pepsi Cola had the sixth largest military um, group of items in the world. They were selling Pepsi in Russia. Russia could only pay in rubles. Rubles are not that beneficial uh, outside of Russia. So instead, what Pepsi took as payments were old airplanes, warships, tanks, uh, armored vehicle carriers, things like that. And they would use it for, they would then go sell it for scrap metal. But they took ownership of all those items. So they actually, when you look at the raw tonnage of military um, vehicles, ship, airplane, tank, all that. They actually have the sixth largest military in the world, all because of the barter market. So barter markets do exist. They're not very efficient, but, but they do exist. They, those were the original markets were barter markets before there was such thing as currency. Um, then currency came along and it, it improved trade dramatically because then it wasn't trying to hey, I don't really want chickens, I want a turkey, so you have to go trade your chickens for a turkey, and then a turkey it made it a lot easier. So we like cash markets, cash markets are much more efficient, but there are barter markets that are still out there. So that's everything we kind of touched on during our chapter one talk. Um, please make sure that you know, you're keeping up with the materials. Please make sure that you're keeping up with you know, the lectures, just like you would if you were coming to class, and that you watch these as well. Um, if you do, or if you are sick with COVID, I hope you feel better. I hope you're, I hope you're just having, like, the, the non-symptoms, you're just stuck at home, bored, watching TV, or watching econ videos would be really good. Um, if you're quarantining because you're around someone, I, I hope that you're doing well as well. Um, hopefully everything's going well for you and you'll be back in class soon.